Okay, this is my hero, Emanuel Velikovsky. I wrote a book about him and a paper, and I posted the paper on academia.edu, and a friend of mine is putting out books based on my research. I have nothing to do with the books. I don't do any work on them. He's just taking my papers, and he's, he's putting a lot of his own stuff in here, too. So it, it may not necessarily be everything about me, but... It's based around my papers. That's why I put my name on these books. And the, the same thing with the religion and the giants and the history and all. It's we have to look at all of this again, we, and, and we have to take it with a new, a new pair of eyes. Since mud fossils, everything changed. Now, he wrote "Worlds in Collision," and this is why he's my hero. And he, they they destroyed him. And they ruined his entire life. Now, here's what happened. He's the author of several books offering a pseudo-historical attempts to distort, misrepresent the historical record. No, this is not an attempt to distort it. This is an attempt to put it into perspective to the reality. So he's offering fake interpretations of ancient history, including the U.S. bestseller, Worlds in Collision. It was on number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Number one. 11 weeks in a row, and they forced the publisher to take it off the bookshelves. Macmillan was the publisher, and they were intimidated by academia, and they withdrew the book. And um, because they, academia pulls the shots. Academia runs everything. Trust me, they run everything. There's nothing that they can't dictate. They can dictate to anybody anything they want. Academia, it's like peer review. It's a, it, that's, that's really, as far as I've found, if they won't discuss things, it just doesn't get discussed. And in his case, they couldn't stop him from discussing it because he had a number one bestseller, so they took it off the bookshelves. This is what happens in academia. It's still happening today. Now, it, his whole story was about all these catastrophes. His books use comparative mythology, yes. Ancient literary sources, yes, literary. Talking about it, writing it down. Comparative mythology, what everybody said about dragons, giants, history, flood, Noah, God, gods, all right? He looked up all the planets, Venus, Mars, ancient history, and the positioning, and all this stuff, and what they had wrote, written about all of these things. And his his conclusions were that we were almost destroyed several times. And he says that the deluge had been caused by what he's calling proto-Saturn's enter a nova state. Well... I think it was caused by Venus, but it could have been, ejecting much of its mass into space. Now, a suggestion of Mercury was involved in the Tower of Babylon. Jupiter had been the prime mover. Jupiter was the god of this solar system, and he spit out Venus. All right? And he, he's saying that Jupiter was involved in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah periodic close encounters with a cometary Venus. Now, the co Venus is the one that really caused the havoc, it in a, which had been ejected from Jupiter, from the great red spot on Jupiter. It had caused the exodus events of 1500 BC. Now, this is where it's a little tricky because it was such a disaster that they didn't write it as like, like Noah's flood. This is where I get a little confused. Was this one here when Exodus happened, was that due to Noah's flood? Or was that earlier? Or was that later? But he gives like 52-year intervals, three different passes, I believe. This is something we've got to look into. But anyway, he says periodic close contacts with Mars caused havoc in the 8th and 7th century BC. Now. Which one was the Great Flood? I'm going, the Great Flood was the one that wiped out all the giants and everything. And I think that was prior to the 8th and 7th century B.C. So I've got to put it at the 1500 B.C. event, which was when Exodus happened. But they don't write it up as Noah's Flood. That's what's got me a little confused. 
Okay, this is going to get a little graphic. All right, this is the great red spot on Jupiter. And there it is right there. And there's Earth right on top of that great red spot. All right, now they say it's a storm. Now, I'm going to explain it to you. It's not a storm. This is a mound, Venus Mons. Now, this is Jupiter. Right, whoop, I'm sorry. I, get ready because I'm going to show you a human vagina. And I'm going to tell you that, that is a vagina right there. And I, I I'm virtually can prove it. All right, it is the great red spot. They put up a very close flyby and they took these extremely detailed pictures of this and they show that that literally is a female body part. And I will show you right now. So if you don't want to see, don't look. Here it comes. This right here is, is the great red spot. Now, we're going to come back to this in a minute, but look at what you're seeing here. And the things I want you to remember is, you know, what it looks like, basically. And this spot right down here is going to come very, very important. That spot right there. All right. This is going to be important to understand right here. See it running all the way around there? These layering up in here are also going to be, under, you're going to understand, and this channel here. Now, why do I say that's important? Because that literally is this. Now, like I said, it's a little graphic, but remember all the little hair lying around. Remember this, the clitoris, the labia minora, majora, urethra, vaginal canal that tab right there that's the clincher that's the one right there that locks the vagina into the body so it doesn't move around basically and that, I'm, I'm just telling you and there is one of these latches I call them spur locks and they're on every single organ basically so that they don't float around through your body now remember that tab now let me, I'm going to come in real close so you can't really miss it. Alright, you see that tab right there? You see the, how it leads up to it? Like the, the little strap coming down? And then there's a little, there's really a little tiny tab right there. And that strap comes down from there. Alright, the hairline is right around here and all of the flaps of tissue are up there. And this is precisely identical to what we see here. All right, let's look at that little tab, because that's the clincher. I mean, it's not going to be there for nothing. Look at it. That is exactly identical what was on the other one. Now, it's a little bit twisted, because the whole thing is twisting. Yes, there is a swirl here. But that, this is not a storm, not a storm by any means. But you can see there is a swirl to everything, a little bit of a swirl to it, because the, the winds are probably a zillion miles an hour as they pass over. Now let's look at this and think about this. Here we have the great red spot, and that is a bump. And, and on a, a, a woman's body, they call it the Venus Mons. It's the bump right over the vaginal area. Venus Mons. Now, what happened here? Jupiter spins this direction like this. Around and around and around. All right, now, the atmosphere is out here. And Jupiter is spinning under the atmosphere. The atmosphere is coming with it, mostly. But once that atmosphere and so forth hits this mound, which is coming from underneath. The atmosphere is up here. The mound is coming from underneath. The atmosphere has to swirl around it. It's not a storm. The, the atmosphere is coming here, and it hits that mound, and it has to swirl over it. Those are um, vortices. 
All right, they're little spinning vortices where normally it would just keep going, but the bump hits it and it has to go around a bump and it's heavy enough that it stays closer to the ground and it spins. It's just like creating a little turmoil in the atmosphere. And it's, it's because of the red spot being a bump and being a vagina and giving birth to Venus. Venus, I, I just showed you, Earth right over the top of that. And it, it has some activity going on now. Within the last few years, it's turned around and it's sloughed off a bunch of blood. This is back in 2019. Now what this means, I don't know. But this is from May 25th to June 1st of 2019. The Great Red Spot is changing. And I did, it was just in the news yesterday. They, now they th oh, they're talking about the gray red spot. Everything I'm talking about, I'm bringing up to the surface. They're starting to, I'm seeing them in all the scientific journals now. Because I, I get them from everywhere. And I've been mentioning, well, I think maybe I can show you something about the red spot. Hold on. You see this? This just came out a couple of hours ago. Jupiter's great red spot may be younger than they thought. Readjusting the spot's age would fundamentally alter how we see Jupiter's atmosphere. If a spot has been there since at least 1665, then everything they thought was wrong. That spot's been there since Venus was ejected back in um, about 1500 BC. Maybe longer than that. Because they're, you know, these 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 are gods, literally gods. I'm sorry, that's just a fact. And, th and these are what Bill Nye says, Jupiter's superstorm. Well, it's not a storm, Bill. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen one of them, but that's a vagina, and they come giant here on Earth too. And again, another one, a little graphic. This is, this is a petrified vagina on Earth. All right, that's pretty big. They, they call this the Tracian womb cave. Now, you say, oh, that's just somebody carved that. No, they didn't. First of all, right there is a baby's head. This was a, 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 a coffin birth. And that's the head of the baby. That's his arm, and it's broken off where the hand would have been. All right, that's the face, you see it? And it, this is the tissue that would have been the lining of the vagina. It's being broken through. You see it ripped there? Let me come in on that. You see the baby's face right there? You see that tissue being ripped out as the baby's being forced out from the pressure inside? That's from a coffin birth. Now, why is this tiny, tiny, tiny little line running down there. What is that all about? All right, can you see that? A tiny, tiny, tiny little line. Why would that be there? All the rest is, is exactly identical to what a human vagina is. I mean, there's no question whatsoever. It's identical. Except for that, why would that be there? Well, I can tell you why that's there. That's called the linea alba. And you say, well, what does that mean? This is where your, your um, guts attach. So as you, as you, your um, blastula, it's a ball, makes more and more cells, all of a sudden it goes bloop, and it goes inside. So now the ball like flattens and then it comes around and attaches right here. That's the linea alba. Okay, bloop, it attaches right there. Now, and that seam is when a woman gets pregnant, that seam can expand. It's like glued together there. And it can expand. And when it does, it turns dark. And then they call it, right now it's linea alba, means the white line, literally, white line. And it's, it's in everybody, but women specifically, when they get pregnant and everything swells up like that, it, it opens that line up and it turns brown and then it's called the linea nigra which is the, the dark line 
and it, and it is a stark. All right, so what happened as this giant woman died in the flood and um, soaked and then dried out, that line manifested itself and is seen. But other than that, that's, it is what it looks like because that's what it is. Okay, here's the uh, article that just came out a day or so ago. Jupiter's great red spot may be younger than the United States. All right, in other words, hold on a second. All right, listen to this. Jupiter's great red spot may be younger than the United States. In other words, it formed 200 years ago, let's say. This just came out. And, and they've been talking about the great red spot. They're just looking into it because I've been posting it's a vagina. You just saw what I showed you. Now, let's see what they have to say. This is basically from NASA. All right, I'm just going to read it. It's Jupiter's great red spot, a storm larger than our whole planet. The storm that our planet sits inside of there is one of the most visible features of the solar system. Thought to date not long after the invention of the telescope, if not much earlier. However, new evidence suggests instead originated in 1831 and has been mistaken for being a continuation of a previous spot from a century before, making it much, much younger than thought. Well, if Venus was ejected from the Great Red Spot, which it was, it had to be there in about 1500 BC and who knows how much earlier than that. That's my claim. Now, what they're saying is a Galileo and da, 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 they're going on and on and on about it. But they found this drawing from somewhere. This Jupiter painted in 1881 shows the enormous size of the red spot at the time. Jupiter is upside down as a result of the telescope used. So they Jupiter, anyway. Um, now, let's listen to this explanation by NASA Goddard Space Center. And then I'm going to show you something about Mars. It's hard to believe, but this is true. This is what they say. All right, listen to this now. This is IFL Science, and this is NASA Goddard Space Center. And they're going to explain about Jupiter. Now, listen to this. Jupiter is the largest and oldest planet in our solar system. Its history spans 4.5 billion years. This gas giant is made of the same elements as a star, but it did not grow massive enough to ignite. Jupiter's appearance is the result of its swirling interior of gases and liquids, producing a tapestry of colorful cloud bands, as well as the iconic Great Red Spot. I'm just going to do clips because I think they might block me from, sh you know, showing their whole... Uh. Alright, I'm just going to do little clips and explain what they're showing. They're talking about the Great Red Spot. Now again, this is NASA Goddard Space Center. And this is where the clouds hit it and swirl around it because it's a mound. Now, I'm going to just keep showing clips here and there and trying to explain what they're trying to explain. All right, they're showing that it's the Great Red Spot is a gigantic storm, an anti-cyclone. No, it's moving the planet this way through this, the cloud layer, which moves, but it doesn't move as fast as the planet. So the planet spins underneath it, and as it does, it creates this vortices. This is just a, a I don't know, some moon they're putting out there showing a reflection of it on here. But this, our, our whole planet would fit right in there because our, our planet is virtually identical in size to Venus and that's where Venus came out of. That's what was written. Now these are the kind of things we have to look into what Velikovsky said. And everybody on the earth, all this, every, every culture said there was, the, well here's, here's exactly the words that Velikovsky used. Hold on, let me just try to remember for sure. <laughs> All right. 
the feared god Jupiter gave birth to a fiery comet. That's what it was, everybody, that's what their story was. The feared god Jupiter. Jupiter was the god of this solar system at the time. And they could change sexes. So just because it was a male god doesn't mean he couldn't have a female body part. And Ovid in Metamorphosis talks about this. They could have any sex they want, they could be any size they want. And what happened was Jupiter, who was Zeus, would change himself into a hot-looking god, come down on Mount Olympus, and they, they, that, that was where the sex palace was. It, I'm just telling you, that's what it appears. And th this was written about, they had come down to Earth to have sex with the, the mortal women, and they had giants, and that's what did happen. And then, apparently, Jupiter, Zeus, realized what he did, and he sent Venus down to wipe him off the face of the planet, and it, it basically worked. And that was what the Great Flood was. That was the Great Flood, Noah's Flood. And that's when it was dictated to Noah's father to say, make a chest, build a chest. In the, in the ancient Greek myth, it says Noah's father was Prometheus, and Prometheus said to Noah, he said, look, you're going to get a flood, and it's going to be a disaster. Build a chest, which was the ark. So the same story. And, um, but in the great flood of Noah's flood, there's only a few people left and they throw stones over their back and they turn into people. Well, everybody had the same story on earth, so it's, and they must have survived somewhere. And again, the accounts of what will be accepted and what won't be accepted, and what, maybe, they, maybe you want to indoctrinate somebody with a certain claims. I don't know, but uh, you, you, I can start to see that if you claimed it was Noah and he, he, they populated the entire earth, well, they sort of have claim to the earth. Maybe that's what that's about. I don't know. But it, every culture on earth had the same story, so I'm not going with the Noah story being that it was only eight people left on earth and uh, they threw rocks over their back and they turned into people. I don't think I can go with that. But the rocks that they were all over the place were the, the dead people. They were the people that were petrified in the Great Flood. And then population started again quite quickly because they used those bodies to construct things. These giant, giant, giant bodies. And there must have still been some pretty good sized giants because they did some moving of things that nobody can, ex you can't move them even with the equipment they have today. So they must have still had giants half a mile, two miles tall, still that survive somewhere up on the top of mountains or something. And they we're making these structures or whatnot, try to appease the gods or maybe. Who knows? This is, I don't know what to think anymore. I just don't know what to think. As I started digging deeper and deeper into this, the only thing that I you know, want you to understand, and I'm going to say this every time, is that I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And he's the guy that came with peace and love and friendship and compassion, brotherhood, you know, and that's not the way I grew up. You know, that's not the world that I saw when I was growing up. And I don't think it's ever been that way since day one. But now I realize that is the way to get to that level of, of um, eternity that takes you out of this, this realm of despair, which is right now, there's going to be some serious despair. Some people, I just, it just makes me weep to see the despair of so many by so many, and uh, I guess I'm going to leave it at that. Hold on one second. Well, let's just finish up with, with Jupiter, and again, this is going to be a very long series of trying to understand these ancient texts, but this is what we now consider to be Jupiter's great red spot. It shrinks, it grows, and all this stuff. Well. 
that's what's called dilation. All right, so the Great Red Spot is a gigantic storm, an anticyclone. It's all the cloud covering and gas is spinning around it because it is a bump. All right, see, they're showing it as a bump, and they're showing it raging for over a century. It's not bumped up like that because it's raging for over a century. It's bumped up like that because it is a bump, and as the stuff goes by, it spins. All right, now listen to this. 1995, it's been changing over time. The color is deepening. All right, 2009, shrinking and getting rounder. 2015 rounder all right now it's getting pretty round and they're talking about it the storm speeds are increasing because it's like an ice skater it spins faster and faster and faster as they pull in tighter and tighter there is another story here see but then they realize the data reveals the storm isn't spinning faster all right, it's actually getting taller. It's bumping out. It's it's expanding outwards. And they're talking about working pottery, working it out like a, a bowl shape out here. Well, that's exactly what is happening. All right, this is what's happening to the great red spot. They're showing it like it's coming out like this, which it is. All right, they used to be able to fit three earths over the red spot. Now it's just a little over one because it's 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 dilating and coming together and turning round and just as I showed you in all those pictures. Okay, so the final statements is talking about scientists are doing everything they can to unlock more secrets of the mysterious great red spot. Well, maybe they could take a look at this video and address that with some comments from NASA, Goddard, and all the other ones that are making these statements about what they think it is. I don't know, but this looks like um, dilation to me and um, sloughing off these big slabs of red stuff. They didn't, they, they didn't know what to say about it. And... Um, this is back 2019, so we're five years into this since then. This happened all in a matter of a week or so. Okay, my friends, this is another shocker du jour. My friend Harold Peterson sent me this and said, look at this. It's only a minute and 18 seconds long. It's from Trust Christ or Go to Hell. And uh, that could very well be. And this is on BitChute. This is the hidden truth about dinosaurs. This is just stunning. I'm going to play this, and I'm not stealing it from them. I'm also here to support you, my friends. Humans walked with the dinosaurs at this time, which was the Triassic period. And it has the same signatures as I have here. And I'm going to show you this video. It's only a minute and a change here. Okay, get ready. Here it comes. This the hidden truth about dinosaurs. In Glen Rose, Texas, they've got a river running through town called the Paluxy River. Back in 1908, the river flooded, ripped off a two-foot layer of limestone, and moved it 20 miles downstream. Underneath was another layer of limestone, so it's no big deal. All right, so they're talking about layers of limestone. This is layers from the flood. All right, here goes. But that layer underneath contained hundreds of dinosaur footprints. Roland Bird was in charge of the group of guys digging out the tracks, and he reported there were 15 to 20 inch long, clearly defined human footprints with the dinosaur. You see that? I was right on top of the footprint. Now, these were human footprints. I have them here. Now, they're talking about 20-inch 20 foot, 20 inch long. That's still not big. Not big. Mine are, the one I have here is very, very perfect. And um, it's, in, it's in this same layer. As a matter of fact, let me just sh quickly show you that. All right, you see what they're showing here? The dinosaur's footprint was stepping on the other guy's footprint. But the both of them are in the wet mud. This was a, a very quick event when all of this happened. Now, here's mine right here. 
and that's a human footprint in that same clay area they're talking about and it stepped down through this red bed this is the red bed which is the Triassic red bed and then above that would have been the gray clay but this was pushed down through so the gray clay is below the red bed not supposed to be it's supposed to be up above the red bed all right and then the black cap came right down on top that's the Triassic and I am in the Triassic zone right down the street from me they have Dinosaur State Park who has the same kind of dinosaur footprints like that all over the place so I have a footprint right here and this it, and if you see this you can't deny it that's a footprint it even has the balls of the guy's foot look see that hold on let me get these books out of the way you see that those whoops those are the guys the balls of the guy's foot and that's a heel and heel he hit like this boom boom and he kept going I think he was running all right so I have evidence they have evidence all I ever hear is oh there's no evidence no evidence there's evidence everywhere if they start to look all right I suppose I should leave it pretty much at this I showed you those dinosaur footprints with the human footprints in Texas. They're 20 inches long. That's not really that big because this right here is a, a human hand, a left hand. That's the cleave right there. These are the bumper pads around your, you know, this one here and this one here. And that is a tendon that runs right down your hand. If you splay your hand back like that, you got one too. You can feel it right in the middle there. That's it this is grip skin you see the stuff that's peeling off the silver stuff that just lays right on top it's like a glove on your hand and your fingers your toes it's tough tough stuff now in that well you know what i'm going to go back and show you the rest of that video because i don't think i should finish that video they actually found fingerprints or toe prints in in their footprints let me show you something i also have fingerprints all right this was another one it's, this, this is all on my property this is a fingertip it's three feet long from the very back of the pad here to the very front of the fingertip this is still the fingernail you can just barely see it here but it's there and it's not badly kept it's in pretty good shape and this is the little, there's a little slip of bone in between, well it's not bone, but it's cartilage, in between the, the finger joints, so they can push on that. You've got vein and artery. Again, fingernail. Just take your time and look at it. Alright, three feet. This guy, if it was exactly the same size as a human, um, proportionally, it would be, I, I was figuring 180 feet tall or so. Now, remember I said it has fingerprints? Here's how perfect the fingerprints are. You see this? Those are sweat pores. See the sweat pores? And that's a fingerprint ridge, one of these ridges with the sweat pores in it. My thumb is the width of the sweat pore, of the finger ridge. Like, you, you know how many you got on your own finger. The nail was right up in here and immediately basically you start with your fingerprints and that's where it is now I had to break this off to get down to get blood because I did DNA test on this and the other one the big hand I had this DNA tested and I had this DNA tested all right when I found it I could see it was a fingertip but I, I couldn't get there's no blood on the surface because you got to get way down underneath that grip skin I mean it's just, just totally devoid of, of of blood totally so I just whacked it with a hammer and it popped right off like a scab because it's just it's just laying on there that skin you see it it came off just like that popped right off this is just we're just laying right on there I mean it was it was you'd never it would never fall off by itself but when you whacked it it when it cracked it just popped right off it was no big deal to get that off and then underneath it was saturated with blood you know, and it wasn't blood, blood, but it was red, you know, dried blood. You got a lot of blood in fingers and, and toes and so forth. Those are the terminus where your, your blood goes out with the artery and it comes back the vein.
see how much blood is in your fingertips? It is saturated with blood. And it comes down the artery, it comes back to the vein. And in the end, there's two on a side, two on a t end, and two over on this side. And the artery side, they blow right out, and the tip blows right out. The veins clamp off, they have clamps. And I see it in all of my, I got a lot of fingertips. You wanna see something really cool? This is a fingertip, extremely eroded. That pattern right there, that dark pattern, if you can see it, I don't know if you can or not. That's what's called a distal phalanges. And it's the tip of the finger. Now, remember I said there's two on the side that are artery, two veins, and an artery on here, and an artery on here. These blow right out. Those are the arteries. They come up here on the artery side. And these are the two arteries on the side and the one on the end. They just blow right out. This one here is a vein. That's a vein. And that's the vein. You see them? And that one right there. They don't blow up because they have clamps in them. But if you know if you know anything about bones and about the distal phalanges, this is what it is right here. And there's your, your artery, I mean your vein. You see the tubing is still there. The artery just leaks right out because there's no, no clamps on them. And I don't know, like I say, I don't know if you can see that. Let me just swish a taste of water on there. Sometimes it makes a big difference. Well, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the uh, distal phalanges right there. And it's very, very highly eroded, obviously. But this, I believe, was also part of that hand because I have other fingers. And remember this. Remember that little glitch right there. This eroded down. Right there was where the tendons locked in. Right, exactly right there. All right, don't forget that little hook. Watch this. This right here is the, <laughs> that's another fingertip. It didn't erode like this one. But there's that little hook. It's right here over here. As a matter of fact, I got the fingertip here. Hold on. Uh, it's around here somewhere. Oh, here it is. All right. Now, I got a little piece of Velcro holding this part on here which I broke off to get to the bone but you see there that's well I might as well take it off all right what happened oops there it goes this was right here all right this is that fingertip right there this was where the fingernail was. This is a 2D CAT scan. I had 2D and 3D done. Jesse Grant and Associates did seven CAT scans for me. The best people you ever want to hear or work with. Jesse Grant and Associates. They're in Canada and the United States. Very, very good people. That is that hook. It's right there. You see it? And it's the same one as right here. You see it? <laughs> This one's just highly eroded. And this one is not as eroded. And you can see the fingernail bed in there. You wouldn't see it looking at this. And on this side, you can't see a whole lot either. But there's actually the distal, um, the uh, apical tuft right there. And this came off, and you can actually see the bone right down there. If you look at it, you can see a little bubbly looking stuff. That's the bone. And this right here was where the the um, tendon went up the side. All right, and that's, that's the 3D, I mean 2D. Now, I also have this one, which is also 2D. Now, this is this looking right like this. This piece is gone now. You see, they're, they're both tendons. They're, they're both identical. One of them's black, one of them's white. And they all do that because of the blood. You see that little hole in there? I believe that was the artery. This is the artery side because it turned white, which means all the red blood ran out of it. This, I believe, is 
right there, that hole is from the vein side. And veins turn black. And this right here is from the bone. And I believe this is a right hand thumb. <laughs> and you can say, how would I know that? Well, here's how I know. Because this lump hanging over the edge. At first I thought it must have died laying like this. But no, there's no, there's no indication that it did lie da laying like that. No, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it died laying like this. This is what I see as the, as the land just flat like that. So why would the bone be way off to the side? That's not normal. Well, it's not normal for a normal finger, but it's normal for a thumb. All right, you see normal fingers? They run straight up. The bone's right in the middle. It's not going to be way over here. Thumb is totally different. You see this? That's where the bone runs, right up this side. That side here is a lump. You see the lump sticking off? The lump sticking off that side? And this is, the, like I said, it's a right-hand thumb because the lump is sticking off to this side. Anyway, you can, you can find out a lot by looking at the little bitty details. And this was, uh, I'm not showing the 3D. The 3D, you couldn't see a whole lot. You could just see where the bone was. You could see an impression in here, like where the bone was. 3D, these are so transitioned they're just literally made into mud in some cases and this is the case well you know what let me just show you all right this is the 3d and again you don't you see it you don't see hardly anything when you get deep in there you don't see much but here when you get just starting to get in you can see where that bone was all right the bone is here and you can see it shadowed in here so that's where the bone was these are blood supplies and so forth coming up to feed the tissues but that's about as much as you get out of the 3d the 3d was not really impressive because it's just the, the type of material we're dealing with it's not that they didn't do a good job they did a fabulous job i had other cat scans done and there was just no no detail at all there's just none whatsoever jesse garan associates they're the best there is okay my friends i'm i'm gonna probably cl close it up for now but they're talking about the dinosaur darwin mist there is a, a layer called the triassic layer it was supposed to be 560 million years ago now this is what they found down in texas they found dinosaur footprints with human footprints right next to them the human footprints were 20 inches long they were from a good size human now Glen Rose has a population of around 2,000, but controversial the Paluxy is, for the area around it contains one of the heaviest concentrations of dinosaur tracks in the country. On this, everyone is agreed, creationists and evolutionists alike. Where the two sides disagree is on the question of whether alongside those dinosaur tracks, there can also be found human fossilized footprints and I have them here as I think I already showed you or, or you're going to see a lot of it. It's time to get this straightened out and, and look at the evidence. Not only is it there, I have it here in Connecticut. Now I'm not sure in this video if I showed you this yet but this is a three foot plus wide human hand. So a 20 foot long footprint is no big deal. This is three feet wide and I have them bigger than this and this is DNA tested human mitochondrial dna is human it's the same as everybody else's mitochondrial dna which means it's human and this is a left human hand that's the cleave right there these are the pads this is the grip skin the silvery stuff that's peeling off i have the fingers and knuckles and so forth i've had them cast scan dna tested it is human it is good size and it is found right next to human footprints I'm pretty sure I showed you this already, but I showed it so many times I get lost. This is the footprint, and this is the red bed, but the gray clay is pushed down through the red bed. Then the black cap, which was on top there, I found all three of them in this wedge. And that should have been right across red, then on top of that gray, 
then on top it had black. Well, no. It's red bed, but it was still wet when the gray clay landed on top of the red bed. Then the guy stepped on the gray clay, pushed it through the red bed, and the black cap came down from all the soot and everything coming out of the sky. Velikovsky is the guy. He's the guy. We, we, we've got to go through all of his books because not only did this happen, then there was ages in chaos. There was the sea people. How did they regroup on the earth? Where did they come from? There was the sea people just all of a sudden showed up. Nobody knows where they came from. They had no idea. And they started to rampage through Europe. I say they were probably the descendants of Atlantis. Somehow they regrouped somewhere because they were seafarers and they somehow wrote out, some of them must have stayed because during the middle BC area I believe and this again we got to look through this I can't remember it all but somewhere in that area all of a sudden they just showed up and started taking every over everything and um, nobody ever still to this day they don't know where they came from you see this is fits in exactly with Velikovsky the sea peoples are hypothesized they say well maybe they were maybe they weren't hypothesized seafaring confederation. A whole batch of them got together. They attacked ancient Egypt and other regions in the East Mediterranean before and during the Late Bronze Age. The Late Bronze Age collapse when the Great Flood happened. Apparently one of, these, one of the catastrophes happened during this period. This was around 1200 BC to 900 BC. They just all of a sudden came out of nowhere. Following the creation of the concept in the 19th century, Sea People's incursions became one of the most famous chapters of Egyptian history, given its connection with, in the words of Wilhelm Max Müller, the most important question of ethnography and the primitive history of classic nations. Nobody knew where they came from, but this is what it says here. They're showing them arriving, and these are giants. The Egyptians were the giants. It appears to me. Now, this scene from the north wall of Habu is often used to illustrate the Egyptian campaign against the Sea Peoples in what has come to be known as the Battle of the Delta. This is like almost 1200 BC, during the reign of Ramses III. While accompanying hieroglyphs do not name Egypt's enemies, Describing them simply as being from northern countries, early scholars noted the similarities between the hairstyles and accessories worn by the combatants and other reliefs in which such groups are named. That's the details you have to look at. How did they, what was the hairstyles? Let me tell you something funny. They talk about hairstyles. Every woman now has those little hair things coming, hanging down the front like this. It's just amazing how easily they're led <laughs> I, I, I can't say to my wife she hates me saying stuff like that but you look all the news anchors their hair comes right down in front of them how like that it's long and f does that thing <laughs> I pick up on things I can't help it alright they do show the, the Egyptians as being giants and being tended to by little people here's another one and there's other ones washing their feet and doing all kinds of stuff. Now, and in the ancient, in the Bible, I believe somewhere in the Bible, it talks about spies going into some valley and saying that we look like grasshoppers to them. So they'd even be smaller than that to some of these giants. And the giant, like I have one out here that's 180 feet tall, it would have been. 180 feet tall. This guy's maybe, well, he's a little puppy, maybe 60 feet tall, something like that. There's another one, giant, he's washing the giant's feet. <laughs> All I can say is that we know there was giants, so I, these must have been the descendants of the really big giants, because these giants, even though they were even 100 feet tall, that's, that's still not giant giant. I know it sounds crazy, but that's just a fact. All right, I'm going to really kind of buzz over this quick. We're going to go through the plagues of Egypt, turning the water to blood, the frogs, the lice and the gnats, the wild animals and flies, pestilence and the livestock, boils, thunderstorm of hail and fire, locusts, three days of darkness, death of the firstborn son, 
composition theology. Let me just leave you with this last note here, and then we're going to be going deep into this. I have to read everything over again. And if you want to go with me, we'll go through it together, because I'm going to read it and try to make statements as I go forward through it, like I'm going to now. This is the composition and theology. All right? Scholars are in broad agreement that the publication of the Torah took place in the mid-Persian period, which is about the 5th century B.C. So the, the publication of the Torah, the publication, remember this, the 5th century B.C. The book of Deuteronomy, composed in stages between the 7th and 6th century B.C., so that was before the Torah. The book of Deuteronomy, composed in stages, so they made a little of this and a little of that and so forth for a couple hundred years, mentions the diseases of Egypt. All right, these are all their afflictions, their plagues. All right, Deuteronomy 7.15 and 28.6, but refers to something that afflicted the Israelites, not the Egyptians. So they're talking about a swap in who is the victim. And it never specifies the plagues. So when you read these kind of things, you don't know what to think. Oh, well, they said this and the other guy said that. None of the, all the scholars are saying that was all nonsense. Well, let's look for ourselves. Let's look at what was written because a lot of that stuff is truly documented. This It's here. It just has to be looked at. And now it has to be looked at in new eyes because of mud fossils. There's no other way to it's just no other way to think about it. There was giants, there was dragons, and Velikovsky had so much detail about this. And the only way to understand it is to go back through it and, and look at it again. Because when I first read it I thought this is insane, but it's kind of interesting. I don't think I really even read much of it, to be perfectly honest with you. I read enough to realize that it was crazy. and But it was a best-selling book for 11 weeks in a row. Number one. And then the academics forced it to be taken off the bookshelves because it, it, it made it apparent that there was some form of a God situation going on here. So what we have to do is dig in. And what, it, what was the situation? Who was in charge? What did happen on the earth? What, what was the catastrophes that he wrote about? What was the Great Flood? Can we show the evidence, which I have, and I'm sure I showed it to you already, but you're going to be seeing things over and over and over again. But that's the way we're going to have to learn, because it's not. this is not well understood. These things are for you to see, and for others as a test. If you see them, fine. If you don't see them, well, go off on your own. Have a nice time. But if you see them, you saw them to give somebody else a test. And you have to present the test. You can't just say, oh, I saw it and I'm going to go sit in the woods and think about it. No, you have to say, well, what do you think about this? This is crazy, but have you seen this? You know, try to be respectful, but you have to somehow be, be open to a, a little bit of a discussion about it. I know you're probably going to be open to it, but most people will not be. So sometimes I, I would recommend you go against me and say, this guy's got, you know, if this guy's right, this is just crazy, but how could he possibly be right? And then they might, at that time, if they say, oh, what are you talking about? Then you got something to talk about. If they don't say anything, well, just keep going about your business. But we're, I'm going to get deep into this. I'm just going to tell you that right up front. These are going to be long, and they're going to be circuitous, and they're going to be deep into every single scripture and every single mythology and every single book and see who said what about what. And Velikovsky is going to be instrumental in this, my hero. And they savage him. This is, oh, this annoys the hell out of me. All right, like I said, the only way to understand this is to go back into his work. And he, this was work. And Emanuel Velikovsky died in uh, 1979, and he was an astrophysicist, a catastrophist, a pseudo-historical, they so-called pseudo-everything, ancient histor history, 
he wrote the bestseller, number one on the New York Times bestseller list, 11 weeks consecutively, and they forced him to take it off. It was called Worlds in Collision. It was published in 1950. Now listen to this. Velikovsky's work is frequently cited as a can canonical example of pseudoscience. Well, what, what, everybody says pseudoscience. Well, what does it mean? What does pseudoscience mean? It means consists of statements, beliefs, or practices that claim to be both scientific and factual, but are incompatible with the scientific method, which means we won't look at it. That's the scientific method. Pseudoscience is often characterized, characterized by contradictory, exaggerated, un, unfalsifiable claims or un, reliance. You know, it's, in other words, they're saying you're an idiot if you listen to what he has to say. And he says he has, he has often been used as an example of the demarcation problem. What is the demarcation problem? Well, I can tell you what it is. It means you don't get into our realm if you're not going to say the things we tell you to say. Uh, in philosophy of science, the demarcation problem is a question of how to distinguish between science and non-science. Non-science, they won't let you even speak about it. You know, in the ancient, an early attempt at demarcation can be seen in the efforts of Greek natural philosophers. They, they, they thought they were idiots too. Anybody that could talk about these crazy things, which I, I don't disagree, they're crazy. But true? Yes, they are true. And I've shown it over and over and over again. All you got to do is take a look at Typhon in North Africa attacking the fish just below it. And just below that is Atlantis, which is the eye of the Sahara. Now, I'm going to leave it there for that today, but we're going to start getting into a, a, a real deep discussion of these ancient texts. And I'm going to put it together using Velikovsky's core. He's got a, he, he went everywhere and brought them all together and said these were the events that happened, these were the dates, this is what this culture said, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And there is differences. And, and some of them I can fully understand because some of them were at the equator and some of them were at the poles, more or less. And that is, it accounts for, some of them said that this, they had three days of darkness and three days of light. Some of them said they had one day of darkness and one day of light. And that would be on the equator. Another one would be because it twisted the pole. It, there's a lot to talk about. A real lot to talk about. And this is the demarcation. is between education and public policy. It means you, you can't say it unless we tell you you can say it. That to me is... is uh, That's just nothing more than forced recitation. You just say what I tell you to say, and I'll give you a, a good grade. If you can't remember what I tell you to say, I'll fail you. That's like a memory test. This isn't a test of how intelligent you are. And you'll see that, and if you haven't seen it yet, I can't imagine you're in the pseudoscience realm. <laughs> All right, I love you all. Pay attention. Stick with me. We're going to go back to these ancient texts. This relates to eternity, my friends. This is not just something that's spectacular, which it is. Amazing, which it is. Disturbing, yes, it is. Marveling, yes, you will. All right? Stay with me. We ain't dropping down from this. It's starting to take hold. People are starting to get informed about the reality of our lives, which we have been not allowed to even look at reality. It's, anyway, I don't want to go there. All right, we'll talk later. Thank you, bye.